All right. We're good. I want to thank everybody for coming to uh, this Zoom webinar happy hour, 24-hour uh, Dallas. We are a sociable enterprise. We like to, this is regular iced tea. Don't, don't get too worried. <laughs> yeah, but we're glad you're here. Thank you for uh, dialing in. Um, today's uh, webinar is all about the recommendations that are being made by the Restaurant and Hospitality Advisory Committee that um, was uh, pulled together by Council Member Adam Balsadua. And um, you'll hear a report on that. Um, uh, we have with us today several guests who will be talking to you. Councilman Casey Thomas, who I see his name. I see he's on mute, but I don't see his face yet. He's a District 3 Council member uh, for the City of Dallas. He has parts of South Dallas all the way across South Oak Cliff and a good chunk of uh, Mountain View and Pinnacle Park. Um, also, um, uh, the, uh, we have Councilman Adam Basildua, uh, District 7, uh, Fair Park and South, um, uh, who, whose brainchild this was to organize this. We have also with us uh, Tracy Mayer, who is the uh, Executive Director of the Hotel Association of North Texas. We have with us Christopher Aslam who is the uh, CEO of Rock Strategic. They have several uh, quick serve restaurants and uh, real estate, and they um, are in a lot of fronts, but he's also the president elect of the Greater Dallas Restaurant Association's Board of Directors. And then we also have um, uh, Chris Heimbaugh, who's the vice president of external affairs for AT&T uh, Performing Arts Center. My name is Randall White. Um, I'll be kind of facilitating things here for you today. And um, uh, I am the uh, founder and advisor for 24 Hour Dallas, a new nonprofit organization. Uh, so we're glad you're here. So the first thing I wanted to do was introduce uh, Councilman Thomas, but I see that his video is off and it's, oh, here he is. Councilman Thomas, how are you this afternoon? You with us? Maybe, maybe not. We might be having technical problems. It's very possible. I'll tell you what, I'll jump to you, Councilman Basil Dua, uh, Council Member, I guess. Uh, uh, and um, Council Member Thomas, oh, there you are. Super, super, good, good, we're here. All right, what I wanted to do, uh, uh, Council Member Thomas, is just start with the background on the ad hoc committees and the mayor's appointees and, and uh, what, what happened there where we are now and what the intent of all that was for the city of Dallas. Okay, uh, good afternoon, cheers, everyone. It's a happy hour, so uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, thank you, uh, Randall, for all your hard work. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilman Bazadour, for seeing the vision for starting um, this task force work group. Um, from the beginning, um, and I, I can speak specifically economic recovery because that's what I was focused on seven days a week for about four weeks. Um, one of the first things that we began to do is I uh, had a conversation with Dr. Eric Anthony Johnson, who had just got here, and he is the chief of neighborhood revitalization and economic development. And I said, Doc, I said, um, you know, what have you seen? work as it relates to, uh, or are you have a conversation with people in other cities and what are you seeing that they're doing in other cities? And he began looking at uh, a strategy that was focused on um, one, local small businesses, but then also small businesses, local small businesses of color, looking at both sides. And what would be an effective strategy to provide some type of funding? Well, fortunately, we got the mon money from the CURS Act. We were able to take $5 million and put that toward the uh, Small Business Continuity Fund. Well, in, in the meantime, myself and former co-chair Blackman had, a, Paula Blackman had several conversations over several days in terms of what the structure of the committee would look like. And at the time, she knew uh, Councilman Bazadua had been working uh, in, in the space as relates to specifically um, hotels and restaurants. 
And I knew that Councilmember Chad Wentz had been working in that space because we hosted a joint meeting with some of the uh, barn restaurant owners over at my district office at the airport, just so we could hear them out. Now, keep in mind, this meeting was called while we were on spring recess. So we were called back in from spring recess on a Wednesday. And I believe the memo may have come out that Tuesday, creating both committees and saying who would be on which ad hoc committee. So um, we took a few days after the meeting on that Wednesday, began to have a conversation last said with Councilman Blackman about the structure. Um, she began to think about different council members that she knew who were working on different, you know, areas because everybody was working. Everybody was just working in different space in terms of seeing how we could, we could, you know, soften the blow as it relates to the economic recovery. From that point, we held our first committee meeting. It was that following Tuesday and um, we began to lay out the structure. And then we also talked about, um, well, structure in terms of area of focus for each of the council members on the committee. And then we also began to talk about, okay, you know, what do we need to do? Where can we find money to help so many of our small and local businesses that are being impacted by this? And so once we got the funding from the CARES Act, that's when we began saying, okay, we're going to have to create a program. Uh, Eric, uh, Dr. Eric Hansen Johnson got with uh, Courtney Pohl, who is the Director of Economic Development, and they began looking at, okay, what type of program can we create? What will be the guidelines? Well, while we were doing that on this side, many of the council members into their area of responsibility were beginning to have, you know, having meetings. I know there was a, a call with all the Chambers of Commerce. Um, council Member Chad West would, uh, was coordinating that call, and staff was set to meet, call, set the call up. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Adam Madrano was on a call because one of his areas were chambers. That was one of his areas of responsibility. Council Member Chad West's responsibility was small businesses. And so through these calls, we began to find out what the chambers were coming to the table, what they were working on, and how they were trying to find ways to support their members. So moving down the road, we got, got the approval for the funding. Then once we created the program, we had to present it to the committee. After it came and was approved by the committee, the following, I think it was about a week and a half, it came to the council and then that's when we were able to approve the Small Business Continuity Fund uh, for dollars for um, small local businesses. While we were doing that, I know Councilman Bazadua was working, was meeting with some of the hotel uh, um, and maybe motel owners, um, also meeting with some of the restaurant owners. And while he was having those conversations, Randall had reached out to me and said, hey, you know, we have, actually before the pandemic hit, Randall had reached out to me and talked to me about the plan um, that a lot of other cities had already adopted, sent me models. And so this was something that was already, you know, in conversation prior to um, the COVID-19 uh, hitting us having our first positive case in Dallas County. And so um, that conversation continued with Councilmember Bazadua. They set up the, you know, the, the, the task force or work group. I know, you know, there's some issues with different kind of language and, you know, appointed round of chair, my appointee, um, Antonio is, is a part of it and hopefully he's been an active part of it and been able to give feedback, very intelligent guy. And so, um, and I believe that's how more or less we got here. Well, Friday, all the days started running together. I got to look at my calendar. So about a week and a half ago, um, I received a phone call from Mayor's Chief of Staff and she informed me that there was going to be changes made as related to the ad hoc committees. Um, she was going, they were going to combine, there was going to be a memo to come out. And the memo came out at 6.30 p.m. on June 19th. Um, and that they were going to combine the two ad hoc committees into one, and I would be chair of the committee. And so uh, once the memo came, I didn't say anything to anybody, you know, they shared that with me. 
So after the memo came out that Friday evening, um, I began to, because at that point in time, we had started seeing some increases in, in cases as it relates to COVID-19. And so I was, I was not on the social, social uh, uh, in a, in a system, recovery assistance committee, but I would, you know, sit in, I would, so I would know what they were discussing. And so I know at least the last two meetings, there had been a big focus on um, what the statistics were, uh, what the city's plan. Uh, we had Dr. Kelvin Baggett, who I was on the phone with just a minute ago. We're talking every day and sometimes two, three times a day now. Uh, he's the health and health care czar for the city of Dallas. Um, he would present. Then we had uh, Dr. Wong, who's the uh, director of Dallas County Health and Human Services. We had someone, Dr. Pearl with UT Southwestern, and then Dr. Bray, who's set up a phenomenal website if you haven't had a chance to look at it. He's got a great website from UT Dallas, their research institute with, you know, data, different counties, hospitalizations, and you know, almost the whole nine yards. And so um, once, like I said, I got the memo that Friday, I said, you know what, we're getting ready to go on recess, but we need to at least have a meeting. And so we had a meeting last Thursday. Uh, it was at one o'clock. We had to post it Monday by one. And so I had my staff hustling from 8 a.m. to about 12 noon, making sure we got the agenda together. We could get it posted, get it uh, uh, stamped. That way we were good for 72 hours, which would be Thursday at 1 p.m. We focused that meeting strictly around the same individuals I just named coming and giving us updates. Because like I said, we began to see an increase in the cases. And since the council was getting ready to go on recess, which is official now, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. The council was getting ready to go on recess. So I thought it was important for us to at least have one meeting of that committee uh, where we could get an update prior to our recess. And so we focused strictly on, you know, the, the health aspect of, it, of uh, COVID-19 for that meeting. However, going forward, when the committee meets uh, in August, we will, you know, continue with the economic side. So let me give you some, some insight. I know um, around it was really, really concerned for a minute. Um, <laughs> I had text me, I had about eight meetings and uh, back to back to back. And I was like, rather give me a minute, let me process what I'm, what I'm dealing with. I got you. I'm gonna... And so once I had a chance to, you know, get past those meetings, have a few minutes just to breathe, reviewed Randall's text, talked to Mary, who is the mayor's chief of staff, then we were able to see, you know what, this work, even though Councilman Bowser-Dewitt was not appointed to serve on the uh, ad hoc COVID-19 committee, it's still related to economic recovery. And so we can still get the work done. So once I had a chance to process that, I was able to share that with Randall. And that's when uh, I'm sure the last, that email came out because I was copied on it saying after talking to Councilman Thomas, you know, we're gonna continue to be able to do this work and he can report our work directly to, to his committee. And so that's how we got where we are now. And we appreciate that, council member. Uh, it's nice to know that the work of these 19 volunteers over the last two months is still gonna be feeding into the city system. So what I would like to do now though is, uh, and, and I, know, I know I appreciate both of you council members for joining us on break. <laughs> I didn't know when I scheduled this with your assistance that you are technically on vacation. So thank you. And I know, uh, uh, Casey, you need to roll out here in just a little bit. But uh, uh, Councilman Bazaldua, tell us just a little bit about what you're wanting to do with this committee, where you were hoping it would go, and what you see us doing from here. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Randall. I uh, first want to say thank you to um, Chairman Thomas with um, the Ad Hoc Committee and uh, allowing me to essentially act as the liaison to the industry that I, I know most, uh, which is the restaurant and um, hotel industry. Um, there, uh, when, when, when looking at uh, the most productive and effective way um, in addressing the industry, it, it seemed almost uh, at, at like an impossible task because it's so different um, in our industry than that of just about any other industry. And the variable 
uh, all of the variables that go into what that recovery looked like and um, not just for the business owners and not just for the employees, but also for um, continuing service moving forward. Um, and that was going to all be very dependent. I started to kind of get my wheels turning on who I would reach out to. Um, and I started to kind of group uh, together some um, restaurateurs or hoteliers or um, people from the industry that I thought would uh, be able to give a perspective from a certain sector. And the reason I, I thought that that was important as well is that I, I believed that for us to um, address or get feedback, if you will, that was uh, that was that was valuable that was viable uh, from the stakeholders in the industry and uh, uh, feedback that would act as um, not only an enlightenment from something that is so unprecedented like this pandemic has been but also to educate the governing body um, I, I think that it's important for us to uh, not make what I call blind decisions and um, there is a lot of that in governing um, that I've, I've seen even clearer um, since being in this seat. So what I thought was the uh, most appropriate way for us to make sure that um, there was a consensus built by any recommendations that came forward and it actually did reflect um, a voice, a collective voice from an industry was to um, create this uh, advisory committee. And, um, and so I, I uh, really appreciate the opportunity uh, from Chairman Thomas I also really appreciate the leadership from um, Randall White. So I want to say a big thank you to you, Randall. You really um, grabbed the reins, took a bull by the horn, or whatever you want to say. You um, are, are one that I knew I could count on, not only for your attention to detail and your passion for um, the work that you always do, but also because I knew that you would be one that would uh, not let me drop the ball. And that is exactly what you did. So I just want to say thank you very much for all of the uh, time and effort that you have put into this. And we'll make sure one way or the other that uh, all of your time and commitment um, is, is not in vain. There are uh, many of ways in which we can address the recovery of an industry that I would consider to be the most important industry um, in the afterthought of what this pandemic is. And when it comes to the recovery of our economy as a whole, um, again, not just with the business owners, but all the way down to the hourly employees, um, some of those most impacted and most vulnerable through uh, this pandemic are going to be uh, really dependent on our industry um, to come up. Our, um, our city of Dallas is going to be dependent of this industry um, to come back. Um, we are sales tax dependent and there's no question about that. So the more that we can know um, on how we can help from within the walls of City Hall, the more um, effective I believe that transition to whatever this new normal is going to be. Um, I, uh, I, I wanna say that the different sectors that I was uh, um, trying to address were, were the different sectors of dining, everywhere from casual um, to fine dining, um, wanted to make sure that we had full service and limited service um, hotels covered. I wanted to uh, make sure that we had arts um, with, we have Chris Heimbaugh here um, today. Wanted to make sure that we have, um, that we had the event space um, covered. And we also had representation from the, uh, um, I'm sorry, the Visitors Bureau. So for a little bit of everything, um, which was also a very uh, big help to, to round things in. Now, just uh, before I, I wrap this up, the, the, not only are there so many variables to what that recovery looks like, um, there's also a lot of different ways in which we can approach it. And it's not all gonna require um, budgetary um, items. These, these things, to make sure that we can do our part to help this industry along. It's not going to necessarily require us to hinder any budget, um, but there are a lot of things that we can look at, um, whether it be policy um, and or 
just kind of amending some structure uh, that already exists. And so I applaud all of the uh, volunteers that we have had over um, the past month, a little more than um, to participate in um, this committee and give all of the feedback that you have for these recommendations that will come forward. Uh, I know we have a lot of recommendations, some of which we can grab uh, right away and a lot of which, like I said, is meant to educate. And I think that it helps open the eyes. Um, I, would, I would confidently say I'm the most familiar with our industry around the horseshoe. So this is definitely a great um, exercise, I believe, for everyone to kind of uh, open their eyes to a different perspective. Um, and then last but not least, um, there, is, uh, there is a lot of up in the air. There's a lot of fluid. No one knows really where we're going. I wanna make it very clear that we're nowhere close to being done. Um, I, I wanted to say that from the very beginning, um, and I have, and we have to be patient. We have to realize that we are all taking hits um, across the board. One of the things that I um, appreciated through this process with the committee is hearing that although everyone was hit differently, everyone was hit. And um, so with that said, uh, patience is, is, is going to be required, but then a lot of grit and tenacity uh, when we come out of it is also going to be required because uh, we're going to have to go in hard and it's not going to be back to a normal that we knew. It's going to be a lot of adjusting and a lot of uh, uh, willingness to, to change is going to be uh, needed for those, those uh, things to, to go in effect. And for all of you out there who happen to be watching, um, you still have time to fill out your census. <laughs> and the census is extremely important. Everyone needs to be counted. That's how we get funding whenever we have crises like we see right here, right now. Um, if only half of us get counted in the city of Dallas, then when we have federal funding trickle down to our city, we're only getting funding for half the people here. So that's a perspective I wanna just leave with every one of you and every conversation that I hope you have for the next month. Make sure that everyone you talk to, you tell them to go on and complete the census as well. Thank you, Randall. Thank you, thank you, Adam. Uh, and, and we are in a crisis and the sociable economy, the nighttime economy is particularly hit. And so we had uh, 19 members who were active on our um, uh, advisory committee. Uh, three in addition to me will go through the recommendations and then we'll have a little time for Q and A. Uh, and I will also share with you a, a PDF you can download and read all of the report. But we're going to start right now with the hotel industry. We have representatives from the hotel industry on our, on our task force. And I will ask Tracy Mayer to unmute herself and uh, lead us through some of the uh, recommendations, the requests, the asks of the city the of ask. Dallas. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Randall. And thank you, uh, Councilman Basildua, for having us be a part of this committee. And I like your shirt. That's your, your census shirt. We all count. Yes. <laughs> um, and as everybody on this call knows, the uh, hotel industry has been hit really hard. Uh, it's been devastated by this pandemic. Um, many of our workers have been furloughed, uh, laid off. Um, the um, some you know ceased operations. Um, we're seeing that some of those come back online. It's just been. It's just been horrific for us. Uh, we've had occupancy in single digits, low single digits. We're now seeing a little bit of climb out of that, uh, a lot more weekend traffic, uh, which is great. Um, but there's a long road ahead of us. And many of the travel observers, um, you know, are saying the same thing. It's gonna be slower and longer than we had originally thought. And it's uh, what we've seen is going to be like a five, um, probably a little bit more than a five-year cycle to get back to where we were pre-COVID, um, unfortunately. But because of this and because of um, where we are, um, our hotel community's requests have been uh, centered more around those things that could help our hoteliers save money and kind of preserve some of the cash flow uh, with a, a little bit of um, help to kind of reopen the city back to business. Uh, so um, what I was going to do is just hit a just a, about three different points and then Randall it I'm sorry is the um, presentation up? Okay there it is. 
um, our first priority uh, was uh, not our first, but one of them was to defer the code enforcement on issues that require um, capital improvement. And this is significant capital improvement. I mean, this is thousands of dollars that um, putting this reflective um, tape and paint and all of the stairwells in the hotels. Uh, and it's just something that financially our hotels can't afford at this time. So that was an issue that was brought forth uh, by several of our members that if this could be deferred for a while during this pandemic, um, you know, it certainly can be done, just not now. The next uh, request is kind of a grouping of requests. And again, it's to help the hotels preserve cash flow. Uh, we have requested that, um, that the, hotels be allowed to delay and defer their hotel occupancy tax um, payments without interest and penalty. Again, helping preserve cash over these summer months. Uh, we have also asked that, you know, if there's any sort of utility help like uh, water, if, you know, some consideration could be given for waiving or deferring those types of costs. Also looking a little bit further down the road, um, looking at the property taxes and giving a six month grace window for companies to get some cash flow in to pay for their 2020 um, property taxes. So those are things that uh, when visiting with the hotel community were issues to them. The next one is something that will help get us back um, back into business. And the way things are with COVID and all, it's so very important to have our, um, educate our public, uh, traveling public, educate the meeting planners that are looking at all of these different venues and cities to know that uh, Dallas is taking great measures and great steps uh, to instill confidence in the traveling public. And this is one of the ways that we can do it is through the uh, Worldwide Cleaning Industry Association's uh, GBAC, which is the Global um, Biorisk Advisory Council STAR accreditation. This will give a third party accreditation, kind of a seal of approval for our Dallas hotels, the K. Bailey Hutchinson Convention Center, and some of our arts venues. And this will be so, so important when we do start to open up after the crisis, the pandemic um, is there. And uh, we're excited about this. I know that Randall has another webinar coming up on uh, this issue, but we think it will really put Dallas in a very good light. And we know that there is a financial strain on, on all of us, um, but we believe that helping the hotels uh, with some of these cost-saving um, requests will help get our industry back up and running. Also working together to aggressively promote Dallas um, as a destination of choice for meeting planners. Again, when it's safe um, uh, to safely get us back, we can recover economically um, quicker. Uh, we believe that there are some bright spots on the horizon, even though we are looking at a longer um, recovery time. Um, Dallas as a city is well poised. Um, I just saw that um, Dallas has received uh, the second most requests for proposals from meeting planners uh, um, to host a meeting in Dallas, as well as they are the number one city in the nation in terms of the actual RFP, RFPs being awarded. So that's exciting. And we know the future can be bright and it's just gonna take all of us working together and uh, having the city help work with us on some of these issues to get us back and going so thanks tracy those are those were just three of ten asks that came uh -huh. up out of the hotel participants on our team um uh the largest number of asks came up out of the restaurant bar and music venue community and uh, uh we'll let uh, chris highlight a few of those chris aslam hi hi everybody uh, Tracy, I just want to let you know I traveled uh, this weekend. Uh, I needed to travel and stayed at a hotel, and I was uh, very impressed uh, with the uh, protocols and the extra steps that uh, hotels were taking. So that that drove a lot of confidence, um, seeing that uh, the industry is is really stepping up to the plate and doing the right thing. 
So thank you for that. Um, thank you, Councilman, as well, uh, for all the hard work um, you all have put into this. I, I know uh, getting into the um, council and, and especially when there's a crisis like this has um, really tested everybody. And uh, the restaurant industry has faced uh, a, a huge um, challenge in front of it, and not only for the business owners, but for the employees as well. So we've worked hard to come up with a number of tasks that were not so much financially um, financial asks, but maybe more things that could uh, help us uh, streamline things to make it a little bit easier for uh, restaurateurs and, and their employees. So our, our first request, and really it's a priority, is communication. Um, it's, uh, we've had so many roadblocks uh, dealing with everything from the code enforcement uh, understanding or each individual inspector's interpretation um, of the code uh, to restaurant owners understanding it one way to even the employee's uh, interpretation uh, of it as well. So we're looking to establish a clear and consistent and a very clear and transparent uh, web communication of all the federal, state, county, and city executive orders. Uh, that way they're reconciled into one place and how they uh, currently affect the restaurant and the hospitality uh, sector. I know what, there's a lot going on with uh, the state and uh, the governor's uh, mandates uh, all the way down to the counties as well. But having that in an easy to remember website um, that the word can get out where if a restaurant owner or employee or inspector can be referred back to, that would be a huge plus uh, for, for our industry. Um, and uh, also stop a lot of the confusion that goes on. Uh, the second one is kind of a, a, a neat uh, thing. And, and I think uh, we were already ahead of it a little bit on starting a parklet. So um, I, I was just in uh, the little town of Plymouth, Massachusetts, where the um, uh, Pilgrims landed. And they have a little street there that uh, what they did was they barricaded it off, if you can imagine, um, in the evening times and on, on the weekends when it was um, a little bit busier. And the barricades would move in toward the street uh, where the street would become one way and it would allow the restaurants to expand out onto uh, the street a little bit without having to block the sidewalks. Um, the benefit of that from a COVID world is uh, being outside allows a little bit more safety, a little bit uh, more room to social distance. And uh, with the open air, um, we don't have all the recirculating air and some of the safety concerns that we would inside of the building. Um, we're looking for ways to streamline that and also be able to offer other goods and services on that right away uh, during these times. Um, it, it's a really creative way uh, to get people out. It allows people to walk the sidewalks a little bit more free without congesting and uh, enjoy themselves without uh, having to worry about um, the social distancing uh, restrictions. So um, if we can continue down that path uh, and pursue that uh, pretty aggressively, I think we're going to start to see a really nice uh, uh, culture shift as well as a byproduct of that where um, Dallas uh, feels a lot more uh, like a community uh, as well and, and we can uh, bring the sales tax dollars back in to Dallas that we so desperately need while uh, observing the restrictions and the requirements of social distancing. Um, the last uh, request uh, was around building permits uh, and approvals. Um, the building permit process has been already slow to begin with and um, there's things that restaurateurs might need to upgrade or do, especially during uh, uh, the COVID times. And we're looking to see if there was a possibility to eliminate maybe some of the fast track fees and also streamline some of the code enforcement uh, items as well around restaurants. So signage, uh, temporary signage, banners, uh, signs, specials. Uh, uh, things like that to let people know we're open and the new way of, of doing business that might not have been allowed before. Um, if we're going to, uh, surprisingly, there are still a lot of uh, interest in building uh, from restaurant tours uh, because the timeline to build, everybody's kind of expecting it will, uh, they'll be online after the COVID thing starts to die down. So if there's anything we can do to uh, expedite that, that also brings in uh, much needed sales tax dollars 
as well as jobs uh, as well. So there's some really good opportunities that we can um, make lemonade out of lemons here um, if we just work on some of these items to help streamline the industry. We could take a hey, right tour to talk about making lemonade. Thank you very much for that. And I did, I should mention too, we're, uh, we're grateful particularly for Councilman Basil Dua because he is by training also a chef. So he has a deep understanding of these industries of the sociable economy and it's very valuable to have someone who has those insights and you're kind of the go-to person on Dallas City Council when it comes to these things and that's nice to know. Um, uh, another part, and I will mention too that Chris just re uh, referred to three of 24 recommendations that came out of our restaurateurs uh, that were on and chefs that were on our um, uh, team. Uh, next, I would like to segue to our partner in the sociable economy, uh, arts and culture, and Chris Heimball, who's going to highlight a little bit of uh, some of the uh, asks we have of the city there. Yeah, well, thank you uh, very much, Randall, and uh, thank you to Councilmember Thomas for uh, working to make sure that all the work that we've done does not go aside. And uh, Councilmember Basil Dua, thank you very much for thinking of the arts. Um, our industries, uh, the hospitality industry, whether it's hotels, restaurants, um, and the arts, they all really are very much intertwined. And um, like many of uh, my hospitality colleagues out there, uh, the arts has been, uh, our whole community has been shut down since March, March 13th. We've had no revenue coming in. And uh, most of us are doing what we can to preserve cash. And like everybody out there making some very painful decisions because ultimately arts and culture, the, we're basically, we're nonprofits, but we're small businesses. And I don't think any of us have over, you know, 300, maybe at tops, 300 people working for us. So uh, we feel this hard. The people who work for us uh, are feeling it hard. And we know that, you know, people aren't going out to the, the shows, they may not be going out to dinners or staying in hotels or coming to visit Dallas yet, but um, it is an important part of our economy. Before COVID, it was an $891 million economic impact. And so we have just been shut down. And again, some of that impact, of course, is with our partners, restaurants and hotels and whatnot, but we want to get back up and running. So this is a great opportunity. We are the first usually to get hit and we're usually the last to come back because you can imagine many of our experiences, especially in the theaters are wrapped around, our whole business model is wrapped around bringing people together, you know, in, in one experience, usually under one roof for a, a common shared experience, a cultural experience. So um, we're hoping to get up and doing that again soon. And some of these, uh, these uh, recommendations here will help. Um, the first two, I'm going to kind of just go ahead and pull together, but I'll talk about the first one, and that is to allocate federal COVID relief funding to help individual artists and nonprofit arts and cultural organizations that are hurting financially because of the global health emergency. I do know that some decisions are being made regarding COVID funding right now, and I, I think some of it is focused on the venues, and I'll get that in a minute, but there are cities such as San Antonio and Austin and Phoenix who have taken those funds and really worked to get those funds to the organizations themselves and to the artists so that we're able to support them. Uh, the arts community here is a very big, big range. They've got small groups. We've got very large groups, different genres. And as I said, nobody's had any income. And uh, there are ways that federal funds are being used by these other cities, not just the COVID funds for, um, you know, uh, new equipment and things like that, but they're actually using and being very creative with other monies, such as infrastructure monies and uh, community block development grants um, and things like that. So I'm kind of hoping that, that uh, our city can get very creative in, in uh, looking at how we get this industry back up on its feet. And on the second one, one of the ways that we can do that on our uh, priority two is um, advocating for and helping to redirect uh, some of this funding to provide resources for the COVID protections. For instance, we're all gonna end up having to buy more hand sanitizers, do more um, touchless things in terms of ticketing. Uh, and that goes out to even just parking. You know, when people are pulling in, not taking cash, trying to 
uh, get them to prepay for their parking. All these things and all the extra staff that it's going to take to direct people and make sure that people are socially distanced and get them into our seats with a lot of us, um, whether it's the museums or whether it's the theaters, um, even at, if we're even allowed 50% capacity, when you actually get in and socially distance the people, you don't get there. You don't even come close. You maybe get 30, 35%. And for a lot of folks that just doesn't financially make sense. So um, I think some of the ways that this helps ease the burden is um, helping us be able to do this. And in Dallas, uh, we are blessed with a lot of uh, incredible arts venues and the city of Dallas actually owns a lot of them. So taking that money, the COVID money and using them to help those uh, venues get back up to speed uh, so that we're able to accept the community is a great investment that the city could make in its own venues. So we think those are important. And then um, one more that I've got is uh, budget cuts. Uh, Council Member Basil Dua, I know you guys are all going to have to make some very tough choices, but we're urging you all to be very uh, strategic about this and try not to balance the budget on the back of the arts. Um, again, uh, the arts, we're small businesses. We work with the hotels, we work with the restaurants, and we know from the last study that was done in 2015 that the nonprofit arts venues and organizations in Dallas generate $45 million in local tax revenue. So if you're cutting off all the groups and the groups are dying off, that's tax revenue that's not coming back in. We need that revenue back in there to get the general fund healthy again and to help our colleagues out there in hotels and restaurants. So be strategic about it. These are small businesses. They need the city's support and that will come back and help the city in the long run. So thank you again, Adam, Randall, and uh, I think Casey dropped off, but thank you all very much. Thank you, Chris. And again, those were three of 12 requests that came up out of the arts community. You'll be able to see all 12 requests here. I'll give you a link here at the end of the presentation. I'm going to go through, there were some other areas that were represented on our team, and I'm going to speak to some of the recommendations that came out of those groups because we could, couldn't have everybody on the call. So I'm just going to dive right into that. Uh, from the tourism industry, uh, here is one of their requests that came up. And this has to do with again, as a Chris reference in the arts community, see if we can't find some of the stimulus money, particularly since we do not know what's going to happen with some of the bonds for buildings and for repair in the, uh, our uh, arts and tourism sector. Uh, we'll see what we can do to allocate some of the stimulus money for uh, these organizations for shovel ready projects and, and, uh, and encourage uh, public-private partnerships so we can keep things building and growing. We just don't stop and have to pay for it 10 years from now. It also helps stimulate the economy and provide jobs for others. So that's one of the recommendations that came up out of our friends in the tourism area on our committee. Um, food trucks. Uh, uh, Councilman Bazaldua said we have to have food trucks as part of our consideration since there's so much of a uh, part of our lives. And uh, the uh, really important priority, I believe, ask that came out of that community, one of their requests was that we initiate, the city of Dallas initiate an agreement with the other municipality, municipalities in Dallas-Fort Worth so that th these folks can only have to apply for a fire permit and an uh, operational permit once and not in each municipality. We think it's possible. It might even be able to be done through a, 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 an oversight agency like, the, like COG, the North Central uh, Texas Council of Governments. There might be a way to work one-stop application for these food truck folks. They serve a very important role in our experience on the street life and let's help them uh, be, um, let's help them get back in business and up uh, on their feet well by making it easier for them to operate around this, the, the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, special events and festivals, easy ask, easy ask. Waive special event permit fees for the rest of the year in 2021. We do not know what special events are gonna look like. We have yet to hear even about the State Fair of Texas, but the large food festivals, the large festivals in our parks, even the smaller events um, that take place that always require permitting. Uh, let's just waive that permit fee 
for the rest of the pandemic, basically. And that was a request that came out of that group, one of this, one of about five requests that came out of special events and festivals. I do want to mention two other restaurant, bar, and music venue requests because they actually came from 24 Hour Dallas, the organization with which uh, volunteers, 100 volunteers with whom I work. We're requesting that the city of Dallas consider establishing formal, what we call social districts. I know our friends from the Responsible Hospitality Institute are on this uh, Zoom call. They'll be all excited to hear that. We want to create an overlay that uh, allows us to incentivize uh, pedestrianizing streets, encouraging more private investment, uh, create new environmental standards for public spaces, coordinate transportation options, incubate some innovative programs that let uh, the city's um, trash and sanitation and public safety participate in these sociable districts, and then also uh, better integrate uh, the restaurant and bar community with the arts community and the hotel community so we can target some things together. We're all in, I, it's, a, it's a horrible cliche, we're all in this together, but really the sociable in, in industries are in this together. So let's create these areas in our city that are specific uh, because there are a couple of other programs we would like to uh, serve in those areas. And one of those would be another recommendation we would ask, and, and we're talking about reallocating uh, perhaps public safety resources. There's an initiative in Arlington called the Arlington Restaurant Initiative, which is one of the most impressive uh, police, uh, hospitality, uh, sociable district uh, collaborations I've come across in studying the nighttime economy over five years. And uh, uh, it is an opportunity to allocate some resources in a way that presents the uh, public safety in our social districts in a, in, a, in a way that lifts up the place and makes them more restaurants more viable and it doesn't place the burden of policing on the businesses like we're having to do right now with, with masks and all. So we would recommend that the, the city of Dallas pilot a program like that particular initiative. We think that would be something worth exploring in the city of Dallas and in one of those social districts if we're able to get that to happen. Um, there were all total 59 uh, recommendations, asks of our, of our committee of 19. I'd rattle off all their names, but I'll have some problems uh, uh, with pronunciations, I'm sure. Uh, uh, you can see them also at the 24 Hour Dallas website, but right now if you go to 24hourdallas.org on the main page, you can see our full recommendations. They look something like this. Um, uh, it's called Economic Recovery. Um, Restaurant and Hospitality Advisory Committee Stabilization and, Re and Recovery Requests of the City of Dallas. Uh, the other thing we will be doing, uh, Council Member Basil Dua, is I am going to create a report card so we can track how each one of these 59 things um, uh, progresses or stops. Uh, uh, we have had a lot of feedback on this and we want to be sure <laughs> to report back to our uh, the people who help form this. And, uh, um, and that's kind of, um, that's a summary. That's a quick overview of the recommendations and a link to the full document. Um, uh, are there any questions just amongst this group with uh, Councilman Basildur or do you have any questions of us at this time? Because I do have a couple of questions that are coming in from, uh, from those who are watching. Anybody? I will say, I will just say thank you. I think that the uh, report card is a great idea. Um, <laughs> And uh, will we'll, we'll definitely help us keep up with that. Again, I, um, I believe that there are a lot of recommendations that we could um, get moving on now. And there's a lot of recommendations that I believe um, for us to take up in a more comprehensive approach because uh, there is going to be a new normal. And so the, I think that there's going to be a need for a big shift in adjustment. And a lot of the feedback that you all, uh, all provided on the committee uh, was invaluable because, um, it, just as I was hoping, it were, were things that you um, would only really suggest if um, you're going you're going through it day to day right now. So uh, I just want to say thanks again for um, for y'all's recommendations, and um, you know we like accountability um, at City Hall. So exactly. thank you for that, Randall. Sure, sure. Well, let me. Uh, anybody have a question or other comment amongst ourselves here? Are we good? Let me go to a question here. All right, uh, uh, this is actually uh, probably a question for Tracy and uh, the council member. It's from Matt Crittenden. Uh, he is a um, architect, designs restaurants, 
uh, among uh, uh, other uh, uh, structures. He's, he asks, he says, Ms. Mayor mentioned property tax grace periods for hotels. What do the council members foresee happening with proper ta property taxes in general? So, uh, uh, and I guess it segues directly to you, Adam. I've heard that there may be across the board 300, 3% uh, reduction in real estate values in Texas due to COVID. Maybe that's just a rumor. So basically it sounds like, uh, uh, how are we gonna afford anything and what's it going to do to the residents it's all yours adam <laughs> well that is a very loaded question um because <laughs> if i were to go into what i believe we can cut um to make these things happen it's a it's a co another conversation in itself but we're going to have to be very creative going forward with this budget um and this year is not the year that we really need. This next fiscal year is not really what I would consider to be um, a, a, a big concern. It's really the fiscal year of 21, 22. Um, and that's when we're going to, um, well, we don't know what's going on with COVID, but that's when we anticipate to not have federal funding to add to the mix oh. of how we are going to be able to supplement and compensate for a lot of the uh, shortfall. Um, we are the only tax entity on your um, tax bill that is sales tax dependent. So the shortfall that we have accrued has been something that the, the others are not going to feel um, directly. So the, the reality is, is that cuts are going to happen. Now, the, the challenging part is now going to be that to make sure that that is felt evenly across the board um, as much as possible, I guess. Um, but, but maybe even not evenly, um, kind of reimagining um, the way that we kind of go about uh, business as is. But there's a lot of discussion on like what's going to get cut. The police aren't going to get cut because that's something that I'm advocating for. Um, and the police department has room to get cut. Uh, but the reality is, is that no matter where substantial cuts happen, um, everyone's going to get cut, including the police department. There's just no, there's no way that we are going to go into another fiscal year with the shortfall that we are going to experience uh, without seeing there to be some type of leveling out um, across the board. But no one is going to look at the budget uh, or have the budget that they had going into this year. I, I will say though um, that the, I, I have not heard what you said about the statewide um, tax. The city of Dallas has nothing to do with tax values. And that's something that I, I think is a, is a misconception in a lot of people's mind. We set the tax rate the city of Dallas has not increased the city of Dallas property tax rate in well over a decade. The property values are handled by the uh, Dallas County Appraisal District, in which we have appointees to the board, but we do not control what goes on there. And, um, you know, even though we, we need the property tax, I encourage you to challenge those appraisals um, that, that happen <laughs> because they are a little outrageous and they continue to get even more outrageous. So to answer your question with, with, uh, in regards to property tax, I don't believe because of the increases that we've seen with DCAD, I don't believe that we're going to see much of a decrease when it comes to the part of the pie that is dependent on property taxes just because of the value um, fluctuation. And that is, is going to be to our benefit this year. Um, but usually kind of, it, it's always to our benefit, but it plays to the, the fact that we do not need to raise the property tax rate in order to increase the um, amount of tax revenue from property taxes. Okay. Are there any other questions from uh, those who are watching? Uh, you can use the chat or the Q&A either way. I do want to, uh, um, again, re remind folks who are watching, you can go to 24hourdallas.org, download the whole PDF. I call it uh, uh, affectionately the empty chairs report. All of the illustrations with each of the sectors of our economy 
show empty chairs because that's what we need to fill up. And uh, uh, we're ready to do that if we're going to be the kind of city we want to be. Chris. Oh, Ren, I just want to uh, reemphasize that, uh, that a lot of us were obviously, we're concerned about how do we emerge from this safely and our prior, you know, our priorities, even though we're concerned about our businesses, our priorities really come down to safety. We need to be, our patrons need to be safe, our staff needs to be safe, and our cast, in our cases, our artists need to be safe. And I love the uh, the GBAC certification in particular that yeah. uh, that uh, the uh, the tourism PID and the hotels and Visit Dallas came up with because I think that is a great way to kind of set a base standard and grow from it. We've also within the arts community we have been developing our own guidelines, and you know we're not going to get ahead of the governor or try to get ahead of the county judge or the city, you know, but we want patrons to know that we are thinking of this, everything from social distancing to, again, hand sanitizers to a code of conduct, things that we expect of ourselves and we expect of our guests too. You know, mm -hmm. we <laughs> wear a mask, things like that. And, you know, we're building those guidelines as well. And uh, so I just think it's important that the community know that, yes, we're concerned about our businesses, but ultimately we're all trying to be safe. And we want our, our, you know, and granted, you can't guarantee anything. It's about risk mitigation, but we can reduce the risk as much as possible. And that's what we're trying to do. All of us are trying to do. Um, and, and with these uh, guidelines and the GBAC thing, as well as kind of these recommendations, I think will help us get there. I think our customers, our customers want to know that they're going to be safe coming to our mm -hmm. businesses. The Texas Restaurant Association has a new safety uh, uh, certification initiative. Uh, our next webinar will include some of the folks that Tracy was referencing, as well as Visit Dallas. It'll address both the, the ISSA, correct? Is that correct, Tracy? Their, their initiative, their certification process, as well as the latest uh, data on customer behavior and tourism in Dallas. Uh, the short-term visitor or the weekend visitor. So our next uh, our next webinar will be on uh, Monday, July 27th, and it will combine those two. It's about building customer confidence, knowing who they are and who's coming back to our city to enjoy our sociable uh, economy. And then uh, to advertise... I, I want to... Yeah, yeah. I wanted ahead. to just say, um, uh, also to piggyback on what Chris Heimbaugh said, this is something that I believe is uh, important for patrons to, to know that it is, um, it's, it's going to be okay to put your trust into the hospitality industry. And if you look back at just what we kind of take advantage for what our normal is, that standard and expectation of what sanitation and um, cleanliness uh, that exists is um, implemented by this industry. Um, and there is no other, uh, there is no other industry that is going to make you walk into a place and 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 compare the cleanliness that you've experienced other places um, and that starts from within this industry so just as we have set that expectation in the past um, I, I encourage um, as we continue to go out of our shell um, and get out of what this pandemic is to lean on your hospitality industry uh, partners and uh, throw in your trust and and let let us you know continue to be the pioneers through this pandemic because I believe there's going to be a lot of other industries and um, business owners who are going to be watching the lead of the restaurants, the hotels, the event spaces, and the the protocols that are going to be set in place. Um, from the people that do this on a day-to-day -day basis are going to be the ones that are picked up across the board from uh, from other places. So I just wanted to point that out that this is nothing new to our industry. Uh, this is adapting with what we have to adapt with because of what the CDC is providing us as we continue to learn. Um, but at, it, as history has gone on, it um, the cleanliness standards and the sanitation standards have always evolved 
with where those standards have, have been amended with CDC um, and our health regulate, regulatory authorities. So I just want to put, put that out there as well. Okay, thank you, Council Member. And uh, I do want to mention one other thing before we wrap up here. Uh, Council Member Thomas did say that he will, uh, we will, and you heard him tonight too, also say that our recommendations will come into his new ad hoc committee and then we'll also have a ways to kind of uh, uh, get them in front of the various uh, council committees and, and city staff departments where, where uh, they can be, begin to be addressed and chewed on. Some of them are more urgent than others. Um, uh, I do want to also tell you about another or uh, our second uh, webinar coming up. Uh, Monday, August 3rd, we're going to present Dr. Reuben Buford. He's a professor and author of the book, Urban Nightlife Entertainment, Race, Class, and Culture in Public Spaces. We're going to run head on to the topic of racism and nightlife. And uh, uh, we have some things in the works there to uh, uh, bring our community again together to address that issue. I do want to thank our uh, hosts uh, the Hotel Association of North Texas, uh, the Greater Dallas Restaurant Association, as well as the AT&T Performing Arts Center. Thank you for, for joining us, Tracy, Chris, and Chris, and also for helping sponsor this webinar. Uh, brought to you by 24 Hour Dallas, paid for by Elatory and uh, uh, my company. And, uh, and then thank you again, Councilman, for asking me to work with this incredible team. Uh, you can see their names if you go to the 24hourdallas.org website. You'll see a link for economic recovery. You can click on that link and you'll see the members of the team. I thank you all for watching. Um, appreciate this. And uh, I've got your email address now. You're not going anywhere. So uh, uh, thank you again. Have a nice break, Adam. And uh, we'll talk to the rest of you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Randall.